Reddit what is the creepiest true event in recorded history with some significance? The story of, Delphine LaLaurie http colon slash slash n, Wikipedia, org slash wiki slash Delphine underscore LaLaurie, is still one of the most horrifying and unnerving things that comes to mind when we're talking about shit that actually happened. She was a socialite in Louisiana who tortured and maimed her slaves. One day a house fire was started by one of her slave cooks who she had chained to a stove. The slave later said she started the fire as a way to kill herself. When police entered the house following the fire, they found slaves who were maimed due to all kinds of fucked up experiments La Lori had been doing on them. People had their limbs removed and reattached and stuff like that. Reportedly, some of them even begged to be killed. She was never caught. Unit 731 HTTP colon slash slash n, Wikipedia, org slash wiki slash unit underscore 731. Heard of Joseph Mengele? These guys were doing similar fucked up experimentation in Asia, including germ warfare in this, greater than prisoners of war were subjected to vivisection without anesthesia. 15 vivisections were performed on prisoners after infecting them with various diseases. Scientists performed invasive surgery on prisoners, removing organs to study the effects of disease on the human body. These were conducted while the patients were alive because it was feared that the decomposition process would affect the results. 16. The infected and vivisected prisoners included men, women, children, and infants. 17 The most fucked up thing about this is that most of them were granted immunity in exchange for their experiment data. Concerning germ warfare and some other things, I wrote a paper on this in middle school. I researched the ever-living fuck out of it, and I really wish I hadn't. HTTP colon slash slash n, Wikipedia, org slash wiki slash Brian underscore Douglas underscore Wells Brian Douglas Wells, November 15, 1956, August 28, 2003, was an American pizza delivery man who was killed by a time bomb fastened to his neck, purportedly under coercion from the maker of the bomb, after he was apprehended by the police for robbing a bank. The bomb exploded. I think I've mentioned this in a similar thread in the past, but I'm going to go with the bath school disaster. It happened in Michigan in 1927, and to this day it's still the deadliest mass killing in an American school. The story starts with a 54-year-old farmer named Andrew Kyo. Kyo was by all accounts a frugal, some would say stingy, man. And even though he wasn't well liked by his neighbors, his reputation for thrift allowed him to be elected as treasurer of the Bath County School Board, and for a brief time as the township's clerk as well. He lost a 1926 election for the clerk position. However, after running on a campaign that emphasized low property taxes, and at that point he seems to have decided that he would perform an act of revenge against the citizens who had made it possible for the government to take away his hard-earned money. Starting that August, he gradually purchased several hundred pounds of both dynamite and a military surplus explosive called pyrotol, buying small quantities at numerous stores in the surrounding area in order to avoid suspicion. Under the guise of performing electrical work for the school district, he concealed these explosives inside the brick schoolhouse that held all of the district's children. His preparations were so involved that he entirely stopped working on his farm, and paying his mortgage. That December, he also purchased a rifle. In May of 1927, Kiel put his plan into action. He killed his wife, who was terminally ill with tuberculosis and had just been discharged from the hospital, and concealed her body inside a wheelbarrow in his farm's chicken coop then surrounded it with all of his money and other earthly valuables, in order that they could be destroyed together. He then set about systematically sabotaging everything on his farm, cutting the wire on all his fences to render it unusable, killing the trees that shaded it, slicing through all of his grape vines at the root and then wiring the stems back into place so that nothing would seem amiss to a casual observer, and placing massive firebombs inside every structure on the farm. He also used wire restraints to hobble the legs of his two horses inside his barn, to prevent them from escaping from it once the bombs went off, and filled his truck with large quantities of explosives and metal shrapnel. Finally, he started a fire inside his home, and when the volunteer fire brigade arrived, he rode off and told them that they should leave, as they were his friends and they would soon be needed at the school. At 8.45 that morning, 15 minutes after the start of classes, an alarm clock that Kyo had rigged as a detonator triggered the explosives he had concealed inside the north wing of the schoolhouse. A similar device in the south wing failed to activate, but the result of the one successful explosion was more than bad enough. In an instant, the entire north wing of the schoolhouse lifted several feet into the air, and community members miles away were jostled by the shockwave. Burning children were thrown through the windows of their classrooms, and the roof collapsed on top of those still inside. A local resident named Monty Ellsworth who arrived at the scene shortly thereafter described it thus, there was a pile of children of about five or six under the roof and some of them had arms sticking out, some had legs, and some just their heads sticking out. They were unrecognizable because they were covered with dust, plaster, and blood. There were not enough of us to move the roof. The efforts of more than a hundred frantic men were not enough to lift the roof off of the children. 
so Ellsworth volunteered to go home to his farm and get a thick rope that could be used to drag it off of them. On his way there, he passed his neighbor Kyo on road. Kyo favored him with a big smile and a cheerful wave. When Kyo arrived at the scene, he beckoned the school superintendent, whom he hated, over to his carriage. Witnesses saw the two struggling over Kyo's gun, and then Kyo fired a shot that triggered the bomb inside his carriage, spraying shrapnel into the crowd of rescuers and instantly killing both himself and his rival. Eventually, the townspeople were able to clear enough of the wreckage to remove and treat all of the children who were still alive. They also discovered the second timer, and the more than 500 pounds of explosives that it was meant to detonate. You can see a picture of them, here http colon slash slash i, imger, com slash 9 zfp 8 me, jpg. In total, Kyo killed 43 people that day, his wife, the superintendent, four bystanders who were too close to the truck bomb, including an 8-year-old boy who had escaped from the first explosion, and 38 people who had been inside the school, all but two of whom were children between the ages of 7 and 14. 58 others were seriously injured. Kyo's body was claimed by his sister, and secretly buried in an unmarked grave. The only explanation he left behind was a sign wired to a fence post at his farm, it read, Criminals are made, not born. Whenever I think about the bath school disaster, I'm always taken aback by Kyo's behavior. It's one thing to just snap in anger, while that's terrible, it's at least something you can understand on one level or another. But for more than half a year, Kyo lived among these people, made small talk with them, and tipped his hat in the street, knowing that soon he would do his best to take all their children from them in one terrible morning of blood and fire. And as if that weren't enough, the sheer spite on display in every detail of his actions is just breathtaking. He went well out of his way to ensure that nothing he left behind would be of any use to anyone from that point forward. The horses didn't tax his land, but because someone might ride them after he was gone, they had to die. The vines didn't hurt his pride, but because they might nourish someone after he was gone, they had to die. He methodically sowed everything in his life with salt, and even his own death ensured that the survivors would gain no understanding or closure from his passing. Surprised not to see this here already a man named Richard Parker is a character in a book, greater than in 1838. Poe's only novel was published, the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. Partway through the book, the crew of a ship called Grampus finds themselves with a busted boat and no food or water. They manage to catch a tortoise and strip off its shell, but eventually, in order to survive, the crew draws straws to figure out which of them will be sacrificed to provide meat for everyone else. The death straw goes to a former mutineer named Richard Parker, who is promptly stabbed to death, his head, hands and feet thrown overboard. You can read the whole grisly thing here. This keeps the floating Donner party alive a little bit longer, but the two remaining crew members are still on the brink of death when they're finally rescued. Forty years later, this happens. Greater than in 1884, a yacht named the Minionette left England, headed toward Sydney, Australia. Greater than the yacht wasn't really made for trips around the world, so it shouldn't have been a surprise to anyone when it sank in a storm. The four-man crew barely escaped in a lifeboat, but they definitely didn't have enough provisions for survival. They did catch a turtle and eat it. But just like their counterparts in the 45-year-old Poe tale, they needed more if they were going to be found alive when a rescue boat found them. Greater than one man, a 17-year-old named Richard Parker, fell overboard and then made the mistake of drinking seawater to attempt to quench his thirst. Parker started going downhill fast, and that's when his fellow survivors decided they would kill him to ensure their own survival. The men had considered drawing straws, but they figured Parker was so far gone they might as well kill him and drink his blood while it was fresh, instead of risking the contaminated blood that might occur if they'd just waited for him to die due to illness. After stabbing Parker in the throat with a penknife, the three men devoured him. They were rescued a few days later. I just learned about the Highway of Tears http colon slash slash n wikipedia org slash wiki slash highway underscore of underscore tears last week. Missing people spanning decades. The story of Grigory Rasputin and the circumstances of his death. It goes roughly like this. Rasputin was a very large man standing 6'4", 1, 93 meters, and was a sort of advisor to the Royal Romanov family of Russia. He repeatedly healed their fragile hemophiliac son, or so it is reported. He never really belonged to any specific sect per se, but was said to be a holy man. Many rumored him to be an agent of the devil or some possessed being. Pictures of the dude are creepy. Anyway. Among political strife and rumors that Rasputin was seeking more power he was ordered to be killed. He was given a nice meal laced with enough poison to kill several men. After a while with no reaction they promptly shot him in the back. Rasputin fell, but regained his strength and attacked his assailants. He was shot again in the head, and beaten vigorously. They then wrapped him up and threw him in the Neva River. Later it was discovered that Rasputin had attempted to claw out of the ice and finally drowned. This guy, rumored to have supernatural powers along being very large and creepy, survived thorough poisoning. Shots to the back and head, beaten and thrown in the river, and finally drowned under the ice. Edit. Wow. This blew up. 
It should be mentioned that historians are not 100% sure how it happened and most agree that some of it simply isn't true. The brazen bull was a torture and execution device that basically roasted the person alive. It was a hollow brass bull with a door on the side. The victim would be locked inside. A fire was lit underneath the bull and a special design of tubes caused the steam to imitate the bellowing of a bull. Legend has it, with some fairly convincing evidence, that the designer of the bull was locked inside to see if his creation was true to the description. You can read more about the brazen bull and other interesting execution and torture methods here http colon slash slash listverse com slash 2007 slash 09 slash 12 slash top 10 gruesome methods of execution slash the Jonestown massacre. Nearly 1000 people died including men, women, children, and a U.S. representative. The recording of Jim Jones's final speech is truly nerve-wracking. The sounds of people applauding his words then of them dying in agony shortly after while he continues to speak just sends chills down my spine. The rape of Nanking, between the beheading contest between Japanese officers, complete with stat lines published in their local military paper, or the story of Japanese soldiers bayoneting Chinese infants and throwing them in pots of boiling water shit got so bad that the Nazi Germans sent there started helping people escape the city. His name was Rob I believe. Creepiest, and most disturbing is the severed dog head that was kept alive with a machine in the 1920s. Sergei Bruhonenko kept the head of a dog alive with a primitive heart-slash-lung machine. The research learned from such experiments led to the development of the first heart-slash-lung machines, which are now used regularly for all types of cardiac and great vessel surgeries. Overnight at the Battle of Shiloh, April 6, 1862, Pittsburgh Landing, Tennessee. The battle to control a pivotal portion of the Mississippi River had been going all day and the fighting had been vicious and relentless. As night fell, hostilities died down, before long a storm came along that brought a torrential downpour and lightning. The primary sources letters, journals, etc. that came from that night all tell a similar story, as rain poured down. Lightning strikes came from the sky around midnight to light up the battlefield. The effect was to momentarily lift the darkness and let the tired soldiers see the mutilated bodies of their fallen comrades all around them missing limbs, parts of their skulls, lying dead or occasionally half-dead in puddles and elsewhere. Additionally there are multiple sources talking about hogs feeding on the bodies at night, a number of which were not even dead yet. The moaning and wailing of soldiers taking their last breaths lying on a bloody battlefield in darkness as rain pours down and lightning flashes around them is something that has always stuck with me. And to think the soldiers that made it through day one knew that at the first hint of daybreak they'd be firing and be fired upon once again is just chilling. Too late now but the 1956 B-47 disappearance is creepy as fuck. Fact colon 1, plane carried nuclear materials 2, plane was refueled in the air 3, plane was never seen again. No wreckage information, no signals, just vanished into thin air. Riddle me this, someone was traveling through time and needed a refuel of nuclear stuff. Greater than Hinterkaifeck, a small farmstead situated between the Bavarian towns of Ingolstadt and Schrobenhausen, approximately 70 kilometers north of Munich was the scene of one of the most puzzling crimes in German history. On the evening of March 31, 1922, the six inhabitants of the farm were killed with a mattock. The murder is still unsolved. Greater than a few days prior to the crime, farmer Andreas Gruber told neighbors about discovering footprints in the snow leading from the edge of the forest to the farm, but none leading back. He also spoke about hearing footsteps in the attic and finding an unfamiliar newspaper on the farm. Furthermore, the house keys went missing several days before the murders, but none of this was reported to the police. Greater than six months earlier, the previous maid had left the farm, claiming that it was haunted. The new maid, Maria Baumgartner, arrived on the farm on 31st of March, only a few hours before her death. Greater than exactly what happened on that Friday evening cannot be said for certain. It is believed that the older couple, as well as their daughter Victoria and her daughter Casilia, were somehow all lured into the barn one by one, where they were killed. The perpetrators then went into the house where they killed two-year-old Joseph who was sleeping in his cot in his mother's bedroom, as well as the maid, Maria Baumgartner, in her bedchamber. Greater than the police first suspected the motive to be robbery, and interrogated several inhabitants from the surrounding villages, as well as traveling craftsmen and vagrants. The robbery theory was, however, abandoned when a large amount of money was found in the house. It is believed that the perpetrators remained at the farm for several days, someone had fed the cattle, and eaten food in the kitchen, the neighbors had also seen smoke from the chimney during the weekend, and anyone looking for money would have found it. As psychology student, the ice pick lobotomy is something that makes me feel so sick. I won't go into how he developed his method but it basically involved putting an ice pick under the patient's eyelid and then moving it backwards and forward to severe the prefrontal cortex and the frontal lobes of the brain. He then set up a van which he would travel round giving these lobotomies too. He performed it on one thousands of sufferers some including kids as young as four. This made me ill writing it. I did some research for this for my graduation project, and it baffled me how Walter Freeman, 
developer of this method, is not more well known. He didn't invent lobotomies as such, there was an older version referred to as leucotomy that were only to be utilized in extreme cases. According to the inventor, who received a Nobel Prize for this in 1947, these were carried out by drilling a hole into the patient's forehead instead of going through the eyelids. Freeman, however, started using an ice pick he seemingly found in one of his drawers. He rarely washed up before surgery as he didn't care about any of that germ crap. I found it very fascinating how showy he was about this whole thing, as slash you slash lures binding mentioned. He had a van set up which he actually named the Lobotomobile. He often performed in front of an audience, and would sometimes perform two lobotomies at once, one with each hand. He claimed lobotomies to be a universal cure, not just to psychological but also physical ailments, and some reports state that he performed circa three, 500 lobotomies in his career. He would also often send Christmas cards to his former patients.